Your eyes may burn at the very thought of Los Angeles smog, but try looking at it another way. If a picture is worth a thousand words, then this one is worth a billion numbers. Using a supercomputer, scientists take equations that describe L.A. pollution and turn them into images that are easier for everyone to understand. Debris, tornado, that's right in front of us. In the same way, severe weather becomes moving mosaics of spheres and ribbons. Molecules are turned into frenetic dancing patterns. And centuries of earthquake activity condensed into colorful pulsations. These brilliant pictures are giving scientists a new intuitive understanding of their data that endless sheets of numbers could never provide. With supercomputers, our new explorer is answering questions which otherwise would not be asked and teaching a new language of science. Major funding for the new explorers is provided by Amico, celebrating the adventure of scientific discovery for the year 2000 and beyond. Additional funding is made possible by Waste Management Incorporated, providing recycling and other waste services around the world. Hello, I'm Bill Curtis. If we gaze into a crystal ball, the story goes, we can see into the future. Today, with the help of the world's fastest and most expensive computers, scientists are discovering and exploring worlds they've never seen before. Supercomputers are now so powerful, they perform billions of mathematical functions in a split second. But the only way scientists can really make sense of all that data is to transform those billions of numbers into visual images. This process of visualization is not only a new method of doing science, it is literally a new way of looking at the world. And isn't it ironic that it took the development of enormously powerful supercomputers to lead us to the realization that the human brain is best at recognizing patterns in picture form. At first glance, the drug research lab at Eli Lilly and Company in Indianapolis fits the traditional image of such places. Test tubes, beakers and white coats. But among these well-worn tools of the trade is something very new. A workstation connected to a $12 million supercomputer. Of course, drug designers like Dave Heron have been gazing at computer images for many years now. What's new is that for the first time, the computer is powerful enough to animate in three dimensions how molecules really interact inside the human body. On this cutting edge of drug research, the supercomputer has become a laboratory unto itself. The way molecules really are um, is that they're complex and beautiful shapes, and they're in constant motion. And it's only now that we can actually look at a computer screen and see an image that is doing all of the same things that the actual molecule would be doing if you could look at it through one of these microscopes that don't exist yet. Scientists and students around the world are looking at things never seen before. And they can thank a visionary named Larry Smarr for putting this new technology into their hands. He's a very inspiring guy. Uh, Larry is one of these people that just uh, makes you feel excited and makes you, makes you want to go to work. Larry Smarr is the director of the National Center for Supercomputing Applications at the University of Illinois, one of four such places he persuaded Congress to create in 1985. Its mission? To explore a vast new terrain and a new language in which computers are now actually powerful enough to approach the mathematical complexity of nature itself. Nature, somehow or other, is doing a lot of calculations per second to make all this stuff happen in real world. 
and you can't get by if you want to create something that approximates that detail that we see in the real world of nature unless you have a computer that's capable of um, billions of calculations a second. Now a computer is a sophisticated calculator. You punch in numbers and equations, it spits out answers. Supercomputers are simply the fastest, most powerful computers available at any one time. But until the mid-1980s, the U.S. government limited access to supercomputers almost exclusively to scientists simulating nuclear explosions and designing nuclear weapons. In fact, so tight were the restrictions that Dr. Smarr and many others like him ended up studying abroad in order to use supercomputers for their basic research. There were all these Americans sitting over there in Munich in the beer gardens and you know working like crazy and having a hell of a good time. Um, and our German host one time said, um, aren't you ashamed of yourselves? I mean, why you Americans are supposedly so great? You make this wonderful technology of supercomputers. Why do you have to come to Germany to get it access to them, to do basic research? Well, it was like the emperor's new clothes. <laughs> Nobody had called the question. <laughs> so. I said, boy, that's a good question. <laughs> <laughs> really? <laughs> and I went back. We worked with Congress. Uh, we worked with the administration. And we came up with a national plan to uh, put supercomputers back in the hands of academic researchers through the establishment of national supercomputing centers. As a result, maybe in 80, 1985, there were a few hundred academics researchers who used supercomputers. Today, there are over 10,000 we've essentially rebuilt America's human resource pool in using supercomputers and visualization to attack everything, to attack everything from chemistry to astronomy to engineering to art. race to create ever faster supercomputers, breakthroughs have become commonplace. Conventional supercomputers can now perform between two and four billion calculations per second. But why stop there? Companies like Cray Research, Intel, IBM, and Thinking Machines are rushing to build supercomputers capable of more than a trillion calculations a second. And scientists have found that the only way they can possibly channel this gushing stream of data is to transform the numbers into brilliant moving pictures, like this visualization of a developing thunderstorm, or the aerodynamics of a Harrier jet landing on an aircraft carrier, or this animation of global climate change. It enabled us to take a million numbers and to produce just one image. So you could take a million to one gulp out of this fire hose by changing it from the number to the image. This single moving image of a supersonic jet flow represents about a billion calculations. Oh, that's right. Look at this. Now we have the full scale, real time motion of what's happening. Speaking of striking images, here's a rare view Mexico City and a few of the beautiful mountains that surround it on an unusually clear Sunday afternoon. How unusual? Here's the same view of the city on a typical weekday afternoon. The difference is smog. It's a little wonder that some Mexicans take extraordinary measures to deal with this deepening environmental crisis. With a huge population, lots of cars, uh, a geographical condition which allows the emissions to cook, that's the recipe for making uh, poor air quality of the type that we can see today. Greg McRae is a chemical engineer at Carnegie Mellon University. Your eye can spot errors much, much faster than you can find them by looking at the numbers. And what's going Dr. McRae is working with Mexican scientists to visualize the city's air pollution. He's taking their field data and entering it into a supercomputer back in Pittsburgh. Mathematician Susana Gomez knows how crucial this project is. It's a health problem. If we want to go on living in this city, Mexico City, we have to solve this pollution problem now. The problem is here. Cars, trucks, 
and buses spew out most of the city's air pollution. The result, Mexico City surpasses acceptable ozone levels four out of every five days a year. That's more than twice as often as Los Angeles. An ever-exploding population, now 17 million, makes the task of pollution control all the more daunting. But for Greg McRae, it's the perfect supercomputer challenge. That's the exciting part. It's a challenge he's met once before. The 43-year-old native Australian is a veteran of the toughest air pollution battle in the United States, deciding what to do about Los Angeles smog. With Larry Smarr's team, McRae and his colleagues made this influential supercomputer animation of air pollution in Southern California. McRae showed public officials how ozone clouds linger in the LA basin over several days, trapped by swirling winds and weather patterns. He broke new ground by emphasizing the role of nitrogen oxide in creating smog. And this model clearly demonstrates what the impact would be of various kinds of control. A particularly good example of the power of visualization that there was a member of one of the air quality management boards. He had in the past just seen numbers and contour maps and in sort of just very sterile ways of presenting the information. What we did was to do a visualization, and she sort of sat up like this and said, that's where I live. As a result, McRae's model is the scientific underpinning for the current Los Angeles Air Quality Management Plan, the most stringent set of air pollution guidelines in the U.S. How long will it take a city like Los Angeles or Mexico City to clean up the air? If you think of Los Angeles, it's taken over 20 years to get where they are now. I suspect in Mexico City that it's going to take a, a similar length of time to uh, control the problem. But the critical part is that there is a commitment to start. One symbolic step taken by Mexican President Salinas was the shutdown last year of the city's huge state-run oil refinery. Another bold but controversial move was to buy an $8 million supercomputer for the National University, in part to study the environment. Supercomputers are extremely expensive. How can a university or a government justify that? Just to give you a very simple example, in the, in the United States alone, we spend over $30 billion a year just on air pollution controls. If we can shave just 10% of the cost of control, uh, we can pay for these machines in days. They are extraordinarily cost effective in solving very, very pressing social problems. Based on the Mexico City field data, McRae and his colleagues at the Pittsburgh Supercomputing Center created this visualization. It shows how air pollution gets trapped by the mountains that surround the city. The man who guided McRae with the groundbreaking Los Angeles animation sees great things ahead. Uh, I think he's, uh, he's doing a tremendous service to uh, not just to Mexico, but if this works, perhaps to the entire developing world. So if we can put this on the machine, train the people, to use it, they have an incredibly powerful policy tool that they can use. See, one, two, three, four, five, six. Okay, you six, over on that side. The rest of you are on this side, over here. For children with asthma, like these at a special camp near Indianapolis, supercomputers are also a powerful tool in the efforts to design a better drug for this often frightening disease. It's very difficult to breathe and you just get very scared that you're gonna be like this for a long time. To design such a drug using a supercomputer is the goal of Dave Heron at Eli Lilly. Your lungs get stiff and, and they get fluid in them and you just can't breathe easily. It takes a lot of effort to push air in and out of your lungs. Uh, they just don't, they're, they're rigid. Certain molecules in the lungs are the cause of that rigidity. So Heron's job is to create a drug that will block them and keep them from producing the asthma symptoms. To visualize this molecular football on a supercomputer is a form of high adventure. You feel like an explorer because you, you're diving in in three dimensions into this space and looking at something that nobody's ever seen before. The images are so vivid and so brilliant and clear, and the things that you see are so revealing about the way the molecules look that it's just breathtaking. And you really feel like I imagine an explorer would look coming on a piece of terrain for the first time and being the, 
the first man to look out over the Grand Canyon or something like that. Two years ago, Eli Lilly became the first pharmaceutical company to install its own supercomputer. It was a gamble that Lilly was willing to take only after its researchers had learned the ropes from Larry Smarr's visualization virtuosos. We have no intention of replacing the laboratory, but to produce a, uh, a major multi-hundred million dollar a year drug that is a, you know, benefiting a great number of people, uh, drug companies have to go through something like 10 to 50,000 compounds to sort through them in with test tubes and rats and stuff like that to figure out whether this has any effect. Well, ultimately, this is all chemistry. So in a sense, we can help look for the wheat in the chaff with a supercomputer and visualization and perhaps cut a year or two off of that drug design development cycle. 11-year-old David Williams knows it could mean a better asthma pill. It would be real small, easy to swallow. Last real long. So you wouldn't end up missing a lot of stuff to play. A terrifying earthquake shakes San Francisco and Oakland, October 17th, 1989. 62 people die, $6 billion in damage. What actually triggers a quake is a complex riddle of nature, one that will not submit easily even to the most powerful supercomputers. That doesn't keep scientists from trying to solve it. In this valley northeast of Los Angeles, where the San Gabriel Mountains meet the Mojave Desert, is a telltale sign of this great mystery. This is a rather special place we're in. It looks like an unassuming uh, creek bed not far from the mountains. In fact, we're standing right now in the, in the rift valley of the San Andreas Fault. Really? This is it. As a matter of fact, you could take that shovel and expose it right here. You don't have to uh, work too hard, actually. Well, I see a big crack already. The crack is the result of a powerful earthquake on January 19, 1857, that shook the state from Los Angeles to Sacramento. It continues to offer clues to Greg Leisinger, a geophysicist at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena. In fact, you're sitting on the North American plate. I am on the Pacific plate. And if an earthquake were to occur while we sit here, you'd suddenly be thrust 10 or 15 feet to the right while I'd take a ride this way. Beyond that one simple hypothesis about earthquakes, the scientific path is fraught with contradictions. Uh, no two sections of the San Andreas Fault seem to be quite the same. Mm. In this particular location, we have earthquakes repeating every 140 years or so. Uh, not too many miles to the north of here, we find uh, locations where earthquakes uh, recur every couple of decades or so. Wow. Now, Back in the Jet Propulsion Lab, Leisinger and his colleagues use the supercomputer to visualize those patterns of recurrence and to experiment with different theories about what causes earthquakes, experiments for which there is no other laboratory but the supercomputer. So you have the Pacific plate on the left, a fault line between, and the North American plate on the right. That's right. The visualization shows how pressure builds up between two plates and releases that pressure in the form of a quake. The supercomputer can take centuries of this complex earthquake data and condense it into a series of colorful snapshots. The visualization is yet another testament to the influence of Larry Smarr. It was Smarr's team that provided Leisinger with the software he needed, free of charge, through a vast national telecommunications network that parallels the phone lines we use every day. It is simply Smarr's way of spreading the wealth. So many people said, well, gee, I'd like that for my machine. Could, I, could you send me a copy? Well, I mean, it just got to be too big a job because we're not a company. And so we decided, well, why don't we just use the network itself? So we just put copies of all of the software on the network. And from your personal computer, you don't have to call us or anything. You just log on. And if you like it, you just download it to your machine and you're using it. So it's not only free, but you don't have to call. You don't have to fill out forms. It's totally invisible to us. And we've had over 60,000 downloads of our software as a result of that over the last two years. 43-year-old Larry Smarr is himself an astrophysicist who's been using supercomputers to visualize the behavior of black holes. The most important thing that this is going to lead to is the development of the intuitive sense of our science. General relativity has always been a science for mathematicians. 
most physics, you do with your gut. And it's been very difficult for us in general relativity to do that. And I think this is going to be a real breakthrough. While scientists use supercomputers to make pictures from piles of data, others use them just to make pictures. In one day, Americans use enough toothpaste to encircle the globe. In one week, we use enough cans and bottles to wrap the earth four in times. One year, two billion razors. In one year, in one two year. billion batteries. Two in billion one year, batteries. 14 million tons of cardboard year, boxes. 14 million. Box. Its creator is a young artist named Donna Cox, who collaborates with the scientists in Larry Smarr's computer labs. Together, they visualize all kinds of data. Artists are very important to scientific visualization because we're the visual experts of the culture. We know about form, we know about geometry, and we know how to take these techniques and apply them to the numbers to make images that reveal information. Some of this work is in fact a marriage of arts and science, like this one, created with an astrophysicist. It shows how gases stream out of the center of distant galaxies. Pictures like these lead Donna Cox to compare this kind of collaboration between artists and scientists to the Renaissance. Renaissance artists believe that the visual study of nature could in fact reveal the hidden laws of nature. And that's what we're doing today, artists and scientists working together. We're visually studying natural phenomena to understand and be able to predict this phenomenon. But sometimes, even with a supercomputer, all you really want to do is have fun. For example, take this fanciful animation by another artist called Panspermia. Supercomputers offer another form of inspiration as well. I want to go to college and major in computer science. That's great. That's great. That's just what we need more of. Through a national program called SuperQuest, Larry Smar attracts top high school students to his center, where they can do some high-performance computing of their own. The title of my program is Computer Simulated Random Diffusion Process. It is about the fusion of gas. Three weeks of those students being at our center using everything we have. And I must say, they are doing things more advanced so what's the on our computers than I would say probably three quarters of the scientists, the research scientists that are using our center. Those scientists could learn a lot from those high school kids. This Alabama teacher sees the impact of the supercomputer experience. For our students at this age to see what you know, this high-tech stuff can do, they can see the possibilities that they have, that they can jump into now when they go to college and be way ahead of everyone else. That's what I see for them. I wish I had known about it. <laughs> One hope is that by the introduction of personal computers with scientific visualization, you can literally create a chemistry laboratory, an astronomy laboratory, a biology laboratory, and it's all just on a personal computer. It's the software and the visualization that create an interactive environment for the child to explore science. Greg McRae has his sights set on pioneering the use of supercomputers and visualization to address pollution crises around the world. Can we use these ideas in, in places like Santiago, Shanghai, in Australia, transfer the technology throughout the world, collaborate with the scientists in each of the countries, take their unique skills and strengths, and, and so that we increase the community of people who can use supercomputers and visualization to solve you know, pressing social problems like air pollution or water pollution. Using the same tools, Greg Leisinger wants to unravel a basic but terrifying enigma of nature, even if it means finding out, as he suspects, that earthquakes occur with more randomness than we might like to believe. Why would one earthquake wait for 300 years to occur, whereas another would repeat after only 50 years? 
And Dave Heron grapples with molecules in designing drugs with ever greater precision and speed. We're like little carpenters and architects. We design these molecules using the results of all of our computer work, and then we just walk a few feet into the laboratory and make them, and these are our potential new therapies for tomorrow. And having that power to be able to see it and design the molecules and then actually make them um, is, is really exciting. On the horizon for all of them, and ultimately for all of us, is what Larry Smart has dubbed metacomputers. What we're seeing today, I believe, is a transition from a world that we were familiar with in the 80s, where each of us had a standalone computer on our desk that we used. So one person, one computer. To a situation where a person, through their personal computer, out through the network to all these other computers, is effectively using a metacomputer a computer of computers. So when you use your personal computer, it's like you're plugging your hairdryer into the wall. You don't think of all of the power grids and substations and, and generators. You just dry your hair. <laughs> and that's what we'd like to get to, that your personal computer simply becomes a window into knowledge space, and you ask that something be done, and it's done. And you don't know that it's, in fact, this vast meta computer that is making it happen. Larry Smarr admits that he and his colleagues are still working on the hardware and the software for all of this. But if you wake up one morning and find yourself accessing supercomputers as effortlessly as you dry your hair, you'll have people like Larry Smarr to thank for it. Major funding for the new explorers is provided by Amico, celebrating the adventure of scientific discovery for the year 2000 and beyond. Additional funding is made possible by Waste Management Incorporated, providing recycling and other waste services around the world. A video cassette and accompanying teacher's guide are available for each episode of the new explorers. To order, call 1-800-621-0660 or write The New Explorers, General Learning Corporation, 60 Revere Drive, Northbrook, Illinois, 60062. This is PBS.